Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Over to you then, David. Thanks very. Thanks again for joining us. No problem. Okay. Yeah. So so this um, week's session is more focused on the three D model itself, um, how how we use it, uh, and just some some kind of examples uh, of of how we use it throughout um, our project. Um, so it's caught. I mean, the the, the title. I've, I've got at the top is the BIM model. Um, doesn't really make much sense, but it's just what people say because BIM uh, means building information modeling. Um, but in the industry, everyone still just calls it the BIM model. Um, so I've just gone along with that. OK, so just get 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 through it. So um, short introduction, um, a little bit, a little bit about how we use it um, at pre-construction. Uh, through construction and then just a, a very short bit on operation. Um, the focus is is really the pre-construction and construction um, stage because that's when uh, we are we're most involved. So just a short bit about uh, who we are. BAM construction. In the middle, what we're part of uh, the wider BAM group. Um, the headquarters is in the Netherlands. Um, so. We've got uh, design, BAM design, um, BAM facilities management. So it, being part of the wider group, it does give us insight into um, various parts of a project. Um, you know, we, we can speak directly with these people uh, about the software they use and, and how they're using the model. So it is it is quite helpful. Um, this graphic just kind of shows that really um, the kind of feedback loop um, the, the, between the, the th these three companies uh, in particular. Um, so just an example of some of the kind of projects um, we do as well, just so you're aware. Um, we've got an Autodesk deal uh, that just gives us access to all the kind of BIM software that you can imagine. So, so BIM isn't a piece of software, it's, it's just a term. Um, there's you know, endless list of, of software uh, that would come under the category of, of BIM. Um, and uh, we've, yeah, we've got this kind of uh, enterprise business agreement with, with Autodesk, um, yeah, which just gives us free access to all the software that, that we need at any time, basically. And we've got BSI uh, accreditation that gets, we get, we get audited every year um to demonstrate our ability to deliver um what's known in the industry as BIM level two um although, although that term has has changed recently okay so starting with pre-construction um a pre-construction stage we're not designers um we're a construction company so typically we don't model anything um the uh, the design team you know does uh, models and we kind of manage that. At pre-construction stage, we often don't get access to the design models. Um, it's very common that you only get given the models once you're appointed, which is a missed opportunity because there's a lot of benefit that you, that you can get from having the model at pre-construction stage. And, and we'll look at some of those benefits in the next slides. So what we do is we'll, we'll produce these models ourselves in-house which, you know, it's a colossal waste of time because uh, the models already exist. They've already been been modeled by the design team. Well, very often, sometimes they actually haven't. Um, but more often than not, the, the models do exist, but we're forced to basically model them ourselves so that we can get um, benefit out of, of ha having that model and using it uh, for, for our bid. Um, now, obviously we don't do that on every job, um, but if it's a, a job that, that we're really interested in, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go to that effort so that um, we've got the best, you know, the best bid possible. So these, these are just a few examples over the last few years um, of models we've, we've produced ourselves. Um, on the right hand side, these are just renders that we've been able to, um, you know, put into our bid and also just use um, during our uh, during the tender as well, so these are some of the the benefits you get from um, having models at, at the pre-construction stage. 
Um, so vis visualization is just the obvious benefit. If you if you imagine only having 2D information compared to having this, um, helps everybody to understand the design really quickly. It allows us to demonstrate construction methodology in our bid because a lot of the questions um, revolve around that. How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? Um, it's, it's so much easier to explain when, when you've got images um, with with your answer um, and you can actually reduce the number of words that you're using as well because you've got images. Um, these are just some kind of in the middle there. You've got some examples of that walls that were going to be removed. Um, I can't remember what the question was, but but that was a question that they asked. Um, demonstrate clear design intent. So the two bottom images, they almost look like photos, but but they're renders that that were produced um, very early on. Uh, so so the, the you know the client having access to images like that is great because they can give that you know crucial feedback at a really early stage to the design team on any any changes they need made, anything they don't quite like. Um, the visualization that, that that we get from a model is a complete game changer in terms of client engagement in the design process. Just another couple of examples there. So that's just your hoist uh, location shown on images and another couple of renders at the bottom. And then that's the same classrooms in 2D. Um, and as every contractor knows, clients just make mistakes when they're when they're making crucial decisions based on 2D images. They think, you know, they, they, they just it's a lot. It's very common that the people making the decisions maybe don't have the experience um, that 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 you kind of need to be able to make these kind of big decisions just off construction drawings. Um, it's far safer when they're able to not just see images like this, but also as we'll see uh, uh, later on, walk around a model as well. In fact, this is a video of, um, so once this, this was a, a model we produced at tender stage, and then, you know, very easily you're able to produce kind of fly around videos. Um, the software exists now that you're just plotting a few lines and uh, you're getting this kind of drone footage style video, um, which is very helpful for um, the BAM team, uh, anyone involved, surveyors, planners, design managers. Um, it really helps them to understand uh, the design. Here's another another example of visualization, um, which, which is kind of going going beyond just renders. Um, so this it kind of produces that kind of gaming environment of, of your model. Um, most BIM software, it's it's not, it doesn't look very pretty. Um, it's not that easy to walk around. Whereas now there's software, which, um, yeah, as you can see, it, it, it's got like a gaming engine. Um, so everything is kind of rendered properly. You've got sunlight and everything. And uh, the, the, the biggest benefit for this is is really the client because that's where most of the money is saved if if they know their mind really early on they make all the right decisions early on and we don't end up having changes later on that that's where the most money is saved um but as i say that there's big benefit to um anyone involved in in a tender if if they're able to really fully understand um the design so the decisions they are making are, are based on the best information possible. Um, it's just easy to miss things. Even experienced people can can just miss things with with drawings. Because you've got to bear in mind, people are busy, um, people are rushed, uh, so, so mistakes happen, but they're 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 less likely to happen um, when you've got this this kind of benefit of visualization. Just one quick question, David. Is it uh, BAM in-house that, that actually does these uh, models? Uh, you said you do it on the back of architects' models. So do you basically remodel the architects' models? Yeah, we do. So if I go back to those, so so uh, these are yeah. these are models that we produce from drawings. Actually, yeah. uh, we we don't you know we we were refused access to the design models, 
So yeah. all we've got is drawings, and mm. it's obviously you know it's we're at a bit of a disadvantage because um, the drawings were produced from the model, um, you know, automatically. Um, but we're having to do it backwards. We're looking yeah. at drawings, and we're trying to we're trying to produce a 3D model from drawings. And yeah. and as I've kind of been discussing there, it's not actually that easy sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes there's grey areas. There's black. You're like, right, what the the drawings don't really cover this. Um, so yeah, but but that that's what we've done there. Uh huh. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so moving on from that one, yeah. So so virtual reality is, you know, the the last stop really in terms of visualization. It's really the ultimate. Um, so so we've got um, uh, it's a Oculus Rift. I think we've got so uh, so so you, you basically just plug it into your laptop. And you can walk around the model. So there's, there's software required. You can't do that natively within Revit the modeling software. Um, but again, it's that kind of there's just software. It, it, it's got like a gaming engine and that kind of thing. And you plug in the, the VR headset and you can walk around the building. So again, if you're thinking from the client's point of view, um, if, they, if they're really actively engaged and they, they want to make sure that they're definitely happy with the design, and they're not going to be making any changes down the road. Um, they can literally walk around the building and they can actually feel what the light is like here and there because um, the model can simulate the, the artificial lighting, the, the sunlight, because the model is on actual coordinates. So, you know, the sunlight is, is accurate. Um, you can change the time of day and all that as well. So is that someone joining the meeting? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. Students, yeah, yeah. yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so so that that it's it's a a potential massive benefit um, in terms of avoiding those uh, late changes to the design that costs um, everyone, including the client, um, quite quite a lot of money. Okay, so programming um, is so I mentioned planners earlier. Um, so what we do here, and this is, you hear the when you hear people talk about 4D, 5D BIM, um, program the programming is is 4D BIM. That's what they call it. Um, and I don't really think these terms are that useful to be honest. But when you hear that, that that's what they're referring to. So what we do here, and this is the main reason we'll produce models at tender stage, it's so that we can produce not just images but a video of um the our, our construction program so the planner produces a program and then we we link that program to the model so every element of the model we're we're linking the dates to it um and and what you can then do is basically just basically just press play and you can just watch a video of of your construction program as it stands and you can just watch the building going up so from the first image all, all the way through. Um, so I've got an example of that here. Now again, this isn't that you know the software doesn't produce the prettiest pictures in the world, um, but you get the idea. Um, so so dates have been assigned to all of these 3D objects, and then you press play, and it just runs through your program basically. So the the main benefit of this is not just that we can show it to the client and say, right, here's, here's what we're planning to do. Um, this, this is our program. Uh, because again, they, they're maybe not that experienced at viewing um, you know, construction programs because they're, they're absolutely massive. It's quite hard to really see what's going on at any given stage, uh, unless you're really experienced. Whereas a video, anyone can see um, what's happening really. Uh, but there's a big benefit to, to BAM at, at the tender stage of, of doing this as well, because even the most experienced planners will miss things. And when when we um, can can produce a video, the planner can view it and he can maybe spot, oh, I didn't realise those dates were overlapping. Um, I'll need to change that and he'll go back to his programme. He'll change the date a wee bit so something's not overlapping. He'll maybe spot, well, that can't be built on top of this. You know, those trades can't work in the same area. So he'll go back and change his program a wee bit again. Um, it just goes back to that benefit of, of visualization. Um, and it's a, it, it just provides a, 
kind of quality check um, or a safety net for, for the planner just to make sure that his um, his construction program definitely works and he, and he hasn't missed anything um, important. So another thing we can do just because it's quick and it's pretty easy to do is we can test um, different program options um, and again we're, we're able to see what that actually looks like on site. We can animate plant on site as well so we can compare the two options. Um, often the people may be making those decisions um, they're not very BIM savvy so being able to just show them a slide like this it just makes it easier for them to um, understand what's being discussed very quickly and, and make a decision. Of course, you've got a flat site there, you know, but you know, the yeah. planner or the or the the contracts manager might say, well, the site that we're going to be dealing with is going to be sloping or it's going to have a a terrible camber on it, you know, it's just exactly yeah. all these topography issues as well. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And we 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 can produce topography that that matches exactly the site, um, but yeah, it's not all. You know, there might be times where that's not done. Um, if the person producing the, the kind of the model within BAM wasn't aware of that. Of that. So quantification is another um, major, major benefit, and this is what's referred to as, as 5D BIM. Um, so if you remember from uh, a fortnight ago, um, when I was explaining kind of fundamentally what, what BIM is, in the middle there you've got the uh, non-graphical data so that includes quantities. So when, when you model a wall, um, as you kind of pull that wall along, all these numbers automatically update the length, height and, and so on. Um, so that means is, is all we need to do is extract the quantities, um, you know, to Excel or, or whatever. Um, you, sh you shouldn't need to manually measure anything, um, especially if, if you're in a situation where the, the model is trustworthy, the, the drawings are being produced from the model. So there's no reason to trust the drawings and not to trust the model. Um, we shouldn't need to be manually measuring anymore with scale rulers or anything like that. Um, we should just be extracting those quantities and, and saving everyone time. Um, so, so we've got software that, that does allow us to do that. And again, at pre-construction, that's that could be a big time saver, especially when people are busy. Um, you've produ we've, we've produced a model, we can just click a button and extract um, all the quantities and then um, the surveyor can just apply the rates um, to there. So th there is software that allows you to do it all within that environment but our, our, you know, our surveyors they, they, they like to work in Excel, they've already got everything set up in there so we tend to just extract the quantities for them and, and they'll pull them into the, the kind of Excel sheets that, that they already use. But it's a massive time saver compared to um, using drawings and, and trying to, you know, do it manually. There's, most people probably do uh, use digital um, measurement systems now. So, you know, you can take a PDF and uh, you can calibrate it and then you can measure from the PDF, not, not an actual piece of paper. Um, but if, you, if you're able to just extract the quantities from the model, that's, that's much faster. Um, this is the software that, that we use. So you can color code, uh, you know, each, uh, you know, element in, in the model if you want. Um, you can select them and you can see where uh, where that is. I know this image is a wee bit blurry, there wasn't, there wasn't anything I could do about it. Um, but on the left hand side, you can see the various different types of cladding and then the areas there. Um, if the surveyor wants to check just to make sure that nothing is missed in the model, he can click on those and they're all highlighted and he can just make sure uh, that he's definitely happy that everything's covered there. So uh, this software as well, um, it's a slightly different issue, but but it, it's, it's it gives us a, a revisions log. Um, so when the models revise, when we receive a new model, um, the software kind of overlays those models automatically. Um, and we can see what's been added, removed, deleted and so on. And uh, again, we can just hit update and the quantities automatically update for us. There's, don't get me wrong, there's lots of room for improvement in the industry here. 
some of this is um, uh, still kind of theory. A lot of surveyors still aren't getting the best use out of the model uh, that, that they can do. Change is always hard for people, and especially if people aren't very tech savvy, um, you're, you're trying to get them to utilize these tools. Um, but certainly at pre-construction stage, uh, it's it's quite easy to to get use out of it because um, it saves them loads of time to just receive all these quantities. Um, utilizing it during a project where you've got design evolving, um, that that's something where there's there's definitely room for improvement. Okay, so moving on to point layout, another uh, you know use of of BIM models. Um, this involves a kind of laser scan of the site, which is done using a drone. Um, so it produces millions of, of dots. And from that, you import it into the, the point layout uh, software and it, it just generates a model for you. So if uh, you're a client and if you're, you're building an extension, um, or you're going to make changes to, to an existing building. You um, you don't want to, you know, have to model your building from scratch. Um, so so this would save you a lot of money, um, but it would give you the benefits of BIM for your your project. So you can then take that model and um, you can then you know, model from scratch your extension, and you can show anything that's being removed as well. So it's a big benefit where you've got an existing site, an existing building, um, but you're able to get the benefits of BIM even if you're a client in that situation. Yeah, we were thinking of getting a, a Leica um, laser instrument, but it cost a fortune. <laughs> yeah, I think they're normally rented or hired, aren't they, rather than in and practice. They, they spin round. Uh, high velocity and they just take measurements of each point in a room so they could s survey this room in about three minutes easily. Yeah, it's it's amazing stuff really. This is a site, um, so it's, it's a, an existing site in the, in the centre of Glasgow where we built, um, so new, new offices were built on, on this site, um, but it was very helpful to have this um, point survey carried out because this is me in the, the point survey software so I can walk around it. I can, you know, take measurements and stuff. We've got buildings close on every side of the site. Um, so there was a lot of planning involved and it was, you know, obviously a, a tight site, difficult to figure things out. Um, so, but yeah, that, that, that's what it looks like when you're actually flying around inside the software. Um, this is actually a slightly different tool. Um, uh, so this is a drone that's flying around and again it scans the site and it produces a model um, of that site. So what you're actually looking at there is a, is a model. If you look close you'll kind of see the um, pixelation a wee bit. Um, and the, this software is, was able to calculate the cut and fill um, quantities from from the model. So this is an absolutely huge site on a slope um, and the engineer was able to basically fly this this drone around um, to scan the site and then he was able to go to his software and figure out the, the, the cut and fill quantities using um, that, that that 3D model that, that was produced. So um, it's really kind of advanced software. Okay, so moving on to construction. Um, so we've got models for, for every discipline um, being produced, you know, by, by the teams. Um, first thing we do is combine these models together um, before we can kind of carry out coordination. So collapse detection and design coordination is really the, the biggest benefit of, of 3D models and, and BIM. Um, if you speak to, you know, there's, there's some, you know, especially maybe older guys and they're, they're more skeptical of all this BIM stuff and they don't understand it. But the one thing that everybody understands is um, 3D model coordination. Even the most skeptical people, they can see that, that this works and um, it's a massive benefit to everybody. Um, trying to coordinate designs uh, in 2D is, is just 
always going to be difficult and um, clashes on site that are very costly for everyone. Um, you know, it used to be very common, increasingly um, not common at all. So just to exp explain a kind of the typical process involved in, in organising clash detection, um, each design team needs to export their models. That should be done following um, methods and procedures that have been agreed so that everyone's using consistent export settings. Um, in fact, I think I think I'm going to explain some of that in a wee second, so I'll just wait until that comes up. Um, but this is the typical pro process. Export models, share them um, so that everyone has access to them. Federate the models, run clash tests, um, process those results, communicate them, resolve the issues and then repeat. So that just goes round and round. Um, so you're constantly um, checking the design, improving the design, making sure that everything works. Yeah, so this is a few kind of good practice pointers. Um, so using consistent export settings, um, which should be defined in the, in the project documents, um, you get loads of problems when, I mean, even a, a tick box not being ticked can result in um, the models not federating. They're not, in the, you know, not being in the same location. So the way it should work is you've got um, the architect's model and then you, you, you link in the structural model and um, you select shared coordinates and it just comes in in exactly the right place. Um, if the whole design team are, don't adopt shared coordinates, then the model won't come in in the right place and you, you can't go any further. So consistent export settings um, are very important. Um, models being shared fortnightly um, is well, it's the most common frequency. You know, you could share it more more frequently that, than that, especially at crucial points in the in the project. CDE, uh, that's just common data environment. So I mentioned that a fortnight ago. That's your kind of Dropbox type um, system, which is um, the only place where information should be exchanged during a construction project. So we shouldn't be sharing anything by email anymore, um, or we shouldn't be using different systems. We should have one um, CDE where everything is uploaded everyone has the permissions that are appropriate to their role and they can download it from there so you don't have any issues of people not having the access they should have um, that's that's the way things should be done today um, federating the models so um, models can be automatically federated now so even a few years ago um, the models would be uploaded maybe to the, the cde i would then have to download them um, i would then have to uh, kind of import them into my software to get them federated. Whereas now um, we get the models uploaded to the CDE and on, on the CDE itself, there's a, a kind of federation um, section in, on the website itself. So the models are just automatically federated once you've configured it once. So that's an activity that we're not having to manually do all the time after every single share of, of, of a model. Um, running clash tests. So clash tests need to be agreed um, and documented uh, right at the beginning, because if you don't agree that and get everyone to sign up to it, um, you'll actually get, you'll get people saying, oh, we haven't included for like an m and &E subcontractor could say, well, we haven't allowed for coordinating below ceiling services and, and that kind of thing. Um, it does happen, you know, it's just the way everyone's it needs to be kind of commercially minded and uh it's it's still the case that, that you just need to get everyone to agree you know are we going to check m and &E against uh walls and ceilings and stuff like that um once you get everyone to agree on it then you can go forward and, and work uh collaboratively uh with with these the actual clash tests themselves as well when i say shared between the team I don't just mean like agreeing which ones are going to be run. Um, those tests need to be kind of set up in the software. You can then export that file and then um, another team, let's just say the structural engineer, he can import that file into his software and the clash test will show up. So that, that way we know that every team is using the exact same clash tests. 
because the last thing you want is slightly different settings or something like that and people are getting different results so they're saying well I didn't show up in my in my tests and what stage generally David is this in the RIBA plan of work is this would this be stage three or yeah it's pr pretty much as, as soon as possible but yeah about stage three at least um yeah, it's it is awkward when when the design is evolving, you know, quite significantly. That's when you know nobody wants to waste time. Um, so we've got projects where you would think clash detection would be well underway, but actually there's still quite significant changes being um, instructed by the client. So design teams are very reticent to start really diving into this because you could end up wasting loads of time. Um, but yes, as soon as you're pretty sure. The design is not going to change drastically. You would you would really start ramping this up. So point five, they are processing the results. Um, pro so when you run clash tests, you um, you will get false clashes. It's it's impossible to to avoid that. Um, the clash tests you, you do configure them in such a way to try to avoid false clashes. You're not just clashing one model against another you're clashing, um, you know, specifically pipes against um, steel or something like that. Um, you, you will still get false clashes though. Um, so the clash tests need to be constantly refined to eliminate false clashes. So that will be something like in the clash test, you could put exclude, um, you know, uh, flex ducts or, or something like that because um, they, they can be moved so it's it's not a genuine clash um so so you, if you if you keep refining your your tests you're wasting less time processing false clashes and and, and false results so communicating the results um tra traditionally that would kind of be a, a matter of um, running your clash tests in the software and then you would just share that file maybe with another team and they would open the file and they would look through all the all the clashes you've raised in there or it would be done in excel you would you would kind of try and track it in there or by producing a pdf report with lo loads of images in it um, these are kind of some of the traditional ways of, of communicating results but um, the the best way to do it th th there's there's digital issue management software available now um, so, so that you can use that like as a plugin to the software you're already using, um, your, your native modeling software, as well as your clash detection software, which is, a, which is a different piece of software. I've got a video of that um, in the next slides, so I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, resolving the issues is actually the same thing, really. Um, it's, it's far easier to resolve issues make sure that nothing falls through the cracks if you're using digital issue management software rather than going back to excel or something like that this way you can really track you can assign it to a person reminders can be sent in the system and, and so on um, you'll see it we in the next slide actually so um the this is a this is actually on, on the cde that we're using but but as models get uploaded, the software carries out automatic clash detection. So what you're seeing there is a matrix. So on the left hand side, you've got a bunch of models and at the top, you've got loads more models. Um, and the matrix kind of shows you how many clashes you've got between all of these models. So if you click on any one of those numbers, um, it'll take you to the clash detection results of, of those two models and you can then process them. Now, automated clash detection is quite, it's quite handy. It gives you a quick, because it's done automatically, you don't lose anything by, by seeing how many clashes have been, have been kind of, uh, have come back, um, but you can click into it. You st that still needs to be processed. So that was the next stage. You still need human eyes to kind of see, uh, is, that, is that a genuine clash? Um, does anything need to be excluded from that test and, and that kind of thing? Um, but it's certainly, you know, you don't lose anything by having this done automatically in the background. It's um, it is quite useful.
so this is an example of another kind of plugin that we that we use, which is um very useful. A big cost we've got as a contractor is is builders work holes um having to be done on site because they they weren't cast into the concrete at the right time. And uh, we've got this software that that we've just started to use, um, which can hopefully save a lot of money by um, improving the collaboration between the MEP engineer and the structural engineer. So the way the software works on the left hand side, the ME engineer, he can see a duct going right through a big concrete wall um, and he can automatically kind of click a button and a hole is, is, is modeled for him. Um, where, where that duct goes through the wall. Um, in terms of the, the dimensions of the hole and everything, they're, they're configured in the settings. So you can basically set up in the settings, like for, for this type of duct, I need a hole of these dimensions. So that, that's automatically produced. Um, the MEP engineer will then propose a hole is formed in the structural model. Um, so that, that's kind of automated, he'll click OK. And then the structural engineer will open his model. He's got the software running and he then has uh, all these proposals for holes that, that the MAP engineer sent through. He'll review them one by one just to make sure that there's no issues. If there are no issues, he'll click, you know, yeah, OK, approve. He'll accept that hole and the hole is automatically produced in his model. Um, so he, he doesn't have to manually model that hole in. So it's it's far more efficient than the way it used to be done, which uh, would be the the MEP. Well, from the MEP engineer side of things, he would have to manually produce the three D geometry of the hole. Um, so at where that duct is, you can see the square around it. He would have to actually model a square to propose the hole, and the the structural engineer would have to link in the MEP model. And then he would then see uh, he's modelled a, a square here. He's obviously wanting a hole to go in here. Um, I better I better model a hole in, in my wall. So he would then edit his wall, produce a hole to kind of match what the MEP engineer had, had proposed. So it's all manual. It's very easy to for, for the structural engineer not to realise that the MEP engineer has even proposed a hole. When it's done digitally, um, you know, he's got a list to go through and uh, you, you basically can't miss it if, if the MEP engineer has, has asked for a hole to be formed. So it's very clever software and it allows us to, to get that structural model right before we get to construction. Um, because again, this is somewhere where it's it's been really hard to get it right because there's so much effort involved. The collaboration between these two teams needs to be needs to be spot on. This, this is just an example of technology coming in, soft, software being used, which really makes that far easier and less time consuming. And, and as a result, it saves saves us a, a lot of money and, and time on site as well. This is an example of um, the what I was talking about earlier, di digital issue management software. Um, so first of all, this is just a view of our clash detection software. So on the right hand side, you can see the tests at the top and at the bottom, you can see the results and I've numbered, you know, each clash individually. Um, they're color coded for the status of, of that clash. At the top there, I'm just changing between between clash tests. So I've, I've now gone to pipes versus uh, ceilings. So at this stage, I'm just viewing the clashes. I haven't got to the stage of um, communicating the results. So just in a wee second, I'm going to open the digital issue management system. Yeah, OK. So they are what you're seeing is um, all the clashes that have been input to the, the issue management system. So now that they're in the system, uh, everyone can view that on the website or they can view it in their plugin. Um, so the, the MEP engineer, he's got that plugin in his clash detection system as well, so he can view all the clashes there, or he can go on the website and see them see them there as well. So everything is tracked, nothing um, falls through the cracks. Um, it's You've got an audit trail as well for the, these clashes were raised on this date. 
these are the comments that were added um, and the date that a comment was added. You're not relying on, on email chains or uh, out of date um, PDF or, or Excel reports. Everything is live um, and everyone can access it from within their, their model environment as well, which is a bit of a game changer. Um, if I go back there to yeah, to, to here. So on the right hand side there, you can see um, the clashes that have been raised in the, the software. You can double click on any of those clashes and it just jumps you to that location in the model. Um, so it's really easy for, you know, the, the clashes that we raise, it's easy for that team to, to locate the clashes because often the, the problem is they, they just, it takes them so long to locate the clash, they can't be bothered doing it. If you send them a, a PDF report or, or, or something like that, Whereas this, this allows them to jump straight to it, so it doesn't take them any time to, to locate the clash. So David, just on this particular image that we're seeing here, is that a clash between uh, a structure and a pipe? Is that a, a that, sprinkler system, is it? Or? Yeah, sprinkler pipe and ceiling there. It's yeah. just overlapping with a ceiling. Yeah, Yeah, I can just see it now, yeah. 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 So it needs to be lowered, really. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Something along those lines. Some, yeah. Something needs to move. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So so that that this is a far more efficient way of, yeah. of co communicating the results of uh, clashes, but also for the team who needs to resolve it, um, finding those clashes as well. Um, it's a it's a bit of a game changer from how things used to be done. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, okay. So an, another use of the model at construction stage. Just can you hear that? Were you able to hear uh, the the video there? Not not yet. Not right. Yet. Okay. Maybe the maybe the sounds not working then. I, I'm not sure if there's anything I can do about that. Um, I'll just quickly check to see if there's a setting um, that I should uh, be aware of so that you can hear the sound. Uh -huh. um, if no, I'll just I'll just That's move on. It's yeah, it's not that important anyway. No, yeah. I'll 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 just move on. Uh, I'll I'll see I'll see if the video is worth worth showing without the sound. Or, or or maybe a separate hyperlink to that or something like we could. Yeah, yeah, just, I can send that. Yeah. I'll, I'll just move past it and I'll I'll send you a hyperlink to it. So, the the model can be used uh, for for setting out on site as well by by the engineer. Um, so. What you're seeing there, it's, it's a very complex wall. So the, there's pictures in the next slides, so you don't need to fully understand it here. Um, but these are kind of, the, so what you're seeing in purple is, is pre-cast concrete um, kind of parts of the wall that they were, they were hung onto um, a concrete wall. And, and the concrete wall had these kind of slits so that you could hang these pre-cast um, I can't remember what they were called, uh, panels on, onto it. Basically, the setting out was really, really hard. Um, whereas but by using the model, uh, we were able to get the exact setting out coordinates to the engineer on site. Um, so I'm not sure of the next slide. Right, so that, that's, a, that's a wee bit easier to understand. Um, so in the actual wall itself, you can see these um, channels, these slits in the, the concrete wall itself. These brackets had to be installed and then um, each of these had to be had to be kind of uh, hung on the wall in exactly the right place. Um, this is the, the, the V&A Museum in, in Dundee. So it's a, an incredibly complex um, situation for it for the engineer on site. Um, but by by using the, the coordinates from the model, apparently um, it was far easier and quicker to do. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure someone said that it would have been near impossible to do um, without that. So it's just, just another example of how uh, the use of the, the BIM model enabled very complex uh, construction. OK, moving on to data collection. Um, so kind of touched on this. Well, covered this quite a bit actually in the in the first session, but um, the, the model is very much a vehicle for uh, data collection um, during during construction. So the, 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 the 
process for um, kind of organising uh, data collection is first client to define what assets um, have information requirements. Um, so which ones are maintainable assets? Um, then they define uh, what the information requirements are for those assets. And then uh, they define when the information is to be delivered, the format the information is to be delivered in. So that the format is, is, is very important um, and, and you'll see that in the next slides. And then they import that data. Uh, once, once it's been delivered, um, they import that to their CAFM system. So that's their computer aided facilities management system. Now that's that's best practice. Um, not every client has a CAFM system. A lot of a lot still don't, but that's that's where they're all trying to get to. Um, so just to show you a kind of example of now this is very similar to what we showed a couple of weeks ago, but I kind of I still need to set the the kind of foundation a wee bit before I show you. Um, so this is a, a client document. So so they're defining what asset has information requirements. Um, what information is required for those assets and the information that, that they've required here um, is in it's, it's in a industry standard format. Um, it's called COBE. So if you hear COBE um, that that refers to a, a format uh, that information is, is delivered in. And this this bit at the bottom is just when that's to be delivered. Um, I'll show you the next slide because it's a wee bit easier to see really what's going on. So on the left hand side, um, these are the kind of fields that get populated in the model. So for, for type, that just means like if we just take a door, for example, we've got the name for the door, um, category of the door, manufacturer, model number. Um, so the client I could hear some background noise. And then oh, we make... Hi, David. Can you still hear uh, us? Sorry, I must. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. Sorry, that was that must have been my my Wi-Fi. And yeah, I had some some background noise as well. Uh, sorry, I dropped out again. Yeah, um, only got a few slides to go. <laughs> oh, OK, OK, thanks. OK, so uh, I was just showing that. Um, so this is the industry standard format. Um, that information is, is kind of delivered in via the model called Kobe. So at the top, you've got type information um, and that's just like a door type. Um, so the manufacturer of that door type, model number of that door type. So if we just call, if we just call it door type A, um, that needs to be populated um, in the model. Component is every instance of that door on site. So if you've got 20 doors, 20 door A types on site, um, the, the, this information needs to be populated in the model for each door. So that, that could be serial number, barcode, and, and so on, and space as well, because that's the most important one. Um, where is Where do we have door type A? Um, the space that, that that would say room one, room two, and so on. Um, so that, I'll show you actually. So, so it's populated in the model, but then it, it gets exported from the model. So we exported from the model into a Kobe um, Excel sheet. So this is an, it's an industry standard format. So every Kobe spreadsheet um, is, is set out in the exact same way. So it doesn't matter um, what project you're working on. Um, when, as long as Kobe is, is defined by the client um, as the format for information to be delivered in, um, you've got consistency. And, and, and that's a, a major thing. It's, it's, it's standardization is a, a kind of major goal in the construction industry to try to make things more efficient. Um, and one of the big reasons for that is if clients have um, computer aided facilities management systems, 
um, those those CAFIM systems um, they are designed to be able to import Kobe spreadsheets automatically. Um, normally, the, a client would need to spend a long time trying to kind of process uh, an asset list that was produced because it was produced in a not in a non standard format. Whereas when, when we use Kobe, um, that's a standardized format. So the CAFIM systems are already designed in such a way to be able to import uh, Kobe automatically. So best practice is that, you know, the, the, the client is able to just import that and their CAFIM system is, is up and running. It's normally not that simple. You'll, you'll need to do test runs early on in the project to make sure that everything is mapping across properly um, to, to the CAFIM system. But the key takeaway in terms of the 3D model is that the 3D model is a vehicle via which this information is, is kind of produced by the design team. Um, and then it's exported from the model to a, a spreadsheet. And from there, it goes into um, the CAFIM system. I'll touch on that briefly in, in the operation slide actually as well. So this is like a, a micro file, isn't it really? It's going much deeper into layers and layers of information. Yeah, it's it's got all your your asset related information for the project. Um, so so everything that you know the clients defined, we we want this information. Um, all of that is contained within this Kobe file, which was exported from the the BIM model, um, which is a far more efficient way of of um, producing that data than doing it manually in Excel. Um, which is still required by clients. You know, they, they, where, where you don't have models, they'll still ask for this information. You just don't have the benefit of a model to um, to to produce it. Because um, in the model, you've got you know plugins and everything. You can automatically um, uh, classify because you can see there under category, we've classified that using Uniclass. That kind of stuff is is automatically done um, in in the model. So it's it's saves a lot of time compared to doing it without a model. OK, so BIM 360 field, this is just one slide because it's strictly speaking, it's not really BIM or, or the model, but um, this is uh, an app that, that, that our site managers use on site. So on site, um, they've got access to, they, they do have access to the model on the iPad actually uh, via this app. So they can use that. We can set up views for them and so on. But generally, it, it just allows them to do everything they used to do on paper to do it digitally. So um, any QA, snagging, health and safety, um, data collection is quite an important one. So um, any uh, you know manufacturer serial numbers and so on, they can collect that data uh, in an iPad and that can then be imported into the model um, once you once you map it across. So I suppose that, that's the only part that's kind of really relevant to the 3D model. The rest of it is really just a matter of um, doing things digitally ra rather than on paper. OK, so last few slides, operation. Um, now, I've already explained this in the first session that we had. Um, but it's just a just to highlight that this is a kind of real driver uh, for using um, BIM for 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 facilities management. Um, it's uh, trying to well, yeah, it try, trying to get uh, a, a high quality model to um, the facilities management um, contractor. It makes their job a lot easier, but you see that more on, on this slide, really. Um, so the models we hand over to the client contain a, a vast amount of data. Um, and so you can see it here, an example of um, when you click on a chair, you've got uh, data there. Now, you know, the, the most advanced client will have um, a CAFM system, so they won't really be actively using the model in this way because they'll have extracted all the the information they need well we'll have delivered that in a kobe file and they'll have, they'll they'll import that to their CAFIM system from then on 
they're actually using their CAFIM system to, to manage their, their building. Um, they're not using the model kind of day to day anymore. But where you don't have an advanced client who has a CAFIM system, the model itself can actually be of more use um, because they don't have that kind of, you know, they're, and, and this is the case with major buildings that we're handing over. It's to councils who don't really have a CAFIM system that, that they can use. So, so they're they're well behind where, where they could be. But in that case, the model itself um, can kind of become an, an electronic owner's manual. They can walk through their model, click on things and, and get all that data uh, in there. Um, o and M manuals can can be tagged directly in the model as well, um, which can be very useful to um, uh, to a client or, or to an FM contractor. But I suppose when when a when a council, for example, subcontracts to an FM contractor, they 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 probably will have a CAFM system, but where they're managing the building themselves, um, they don't. They've just got janitors on site and that kind of thing. Um, and they might need to be trained in how to use the model a wee bit, but that that does happen, um, and and they do they do get value out of doing that sometimes. That's just basically something just to show you what um, a cafe system kind of looks like. Um, I did ask BAM FM for some kind of screenshots and videos, but they're just changing their cafe system just now, so. They weren't able to to provide me with some, but you kind of you get the idea. Um, the the guys on site they're they're able to kind of do their checks using a digital system, and you know all that information is live and up to date. They get pings and, and notifications when um, uh, an air handling unit or something hasn't been checked in a certain amount of time, and it's now time for it to be checked. Um, they call it planned preventative maintenance. Um, so you know you've got you've got a kind of alarm almost on on all your assets. Um, so so that's kind of bit best practice. This last slide is is just saying that we try to hand over an as built model as as far as possible, which is it's possible with some things. We with our st steel model, um, every steel subcontractor we use they they actually use the model to manufacture their steel. So that means their model is is absolutely, you know, pinpoint accurate. It's got it's got nuts and bolts and and everything modelled. Um, it's strictly speaking, the whole model that we hand over is not really as built, um, because not every subcontractor models in three D. So M and E, they they model in three D. So so the M and E model will be more or less as built as well, but we need to be checking with them that they're adjusting the model based on changes made on site because quite a big problem you can get is um, you know the design is taken to a certain stage construction issue drawings are, are issued but then changes are made on site and the m e subcontractor don't necessarily go back and update their model based on what was actually installed on site so the client could be receiving a model which is correct as of you know, almost before things were actually built, but uh, it, it hasn't, you know, the, the model actually hasn't been updated to reflect what was actually built. So that's a kind of thing that needs to be included in appointment documents so that people are, so that subcontractors are obliged to um, to update their models to, to, to reflect what was, what was built. Um, but there are other things like floors and walls, the subcontractors, they, they, they don't model in 3D, so in terms of level of detail, they, they don't really um, they don't really develop past the stage that the architect uh, modeled it to. Um, so the term as built can be a wee bit misleading. Um, some elements of the, the 3D model are, are, are as built uh, and, and some bits are, are not quite, but but they're very close. So that's okay. that's pretty much it. Yeah, so thanks very much. Any questions? Fantastic. Guys, any questions? Any questions at all, Chris? Um, Oops, I was going to ask what, what the CDE stand for. You used an acronym? Uh, no, not, that's the wrong thing. You used uh, 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 some initials earlier on. 
he said CDE. He said BIM design models are shared partly, fortnightly with CDE. So what does CDE stand for? Yeah, uh, co com com data. common data environment. So it's just like a Dropbox type system. Um, that's the easiest way to explain it. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a central place um, where any information on the project is shared and, and the only place where, uh, where information should be shared. Uh, email shouldn't be used um, for the exchange of information. Super, thank you. Yeah. And do you have um, a particular type of CDE that you work with? I mean, I know that we I, I used four Ps once way back, you know, before. Well, it was it was not that long ago, but um, yes. Does that, does that is that one that you use, or do you, yes. do you use a number of CDEs depend on which su supply chain you? It's you it, it's it should be defined by the client, but so that that means that the contractor is uses lots of different CDEs depending on on what the client defines. Um, so, so 4P, um, I think it's, they've changed it to viewpoint. That's, that's right. still that's still used on on a lot of jobs. Um, Glasgow City Council use use viewpoint. So, so that's quite that's quite a good one. We use Autodesk um, BIM 360 as well. It's um, it's not as developed as 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 for as viewpoint in some ways, but it's more it's a bit slicker and more modern. Um, and it, it incorporates models a wee bit easier. So the likes of a viewpoint, when a model is uploaded, you pretty much need to download it before you do anything with it. Whereas using Autodesk BIM 360, when, when someone uploads a model to their folder, you could just click on it and, you, and you're, you're straight into a model environment. Um, there's lots of other good tools as well. Approval workflows are a, a big thing. So when a drawing is uploaded, um, it should be submitted for review. And when that's done, uh, whoever's supposed to review it gets a, an, an email notification automatically, and uh, they'll then approve the drawing or make comments or anything. And e everything is done through a digital workflow. Um, so you've got you've got the benefit of that. E everything is tracked. Fantastic. Hey, anybody got any other questions? This is massive is there, stuff. Is there, is there a kind of um, contact value cutoff price that, that BIM can't kind of drop down to? If you know what, if I'm expressing that adequately. In, yeah, so in terms of the, the size of the job and the, the value of the job. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, two, two weeks ago, one of the slides I showed was that jobs from 2 million and above get assessed using a grading tool in terms of wh whether BIM should should be used. Um, it depends on supply chain, really. Um, wh when, you, when you've got smaller jobs like that, it's much more likely that you'll be using design team who, who have never used BIM before. Whereas once you're in the, the you know, more than 5 million, um, certainly more than 10, you're 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 not really going to have uh, design teams or contractors who are not experienced in BIM really. Um, at least I would I would be very surprised if there was if there was many. But yeah, it it was a quite a controversial point actually because when when the government mandated it, the, there's the question of what about small architects practices, small design practices. It was seen as almost discriminatory against them because of the cost. They would have to invest to not 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 just to invest in the software, but to invest in training their people to use it when they've got limited use for it, um, and the cost kind of outweighed the benefit. So it was seen as almost freeze, freezing them out of these bigger projects. So it was quite a controversial thing, and that and that's why they introduced that grading tool. Um, so it's it's just assessed above on projects above that value. Thank you. Yeah. And on that same point, do you get any subcontractors, David, that maybe they start off at a very low level of knowledge, skill, whatever that might be, and then they get to the end of a project and they say, we, we don't know why we didn't do this earlier, or, or are they still skeptical? Can you give us any good examples of the supply chain really, really starting from a low level on a project and they're basically embracing it? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. We, we Well, there was a project not that long ago and, and the architect had never used it before. They were they were using AutoCAD and it was their first uh, Revit project and it was like a £50 million pound office development. So it was a massive project. But um, throughout that project, as they were using it, you know, they could just see it was an absolute no-brainer and it was a game changer in terms of how efficiently they could produce the design and, and manage it compared to AutoCAD. Um, so yeah, that that was an example of that someone who was who was brand new to it. We've still got subcontractors who are dipping their toes in the water as well. Um, we've got facade subcontractors, so that's a, an element of the design which traditionally it hasn't been produced by a subcontractor. You know, the architect will model the, the facade and their model anyway. Um, but uh, I, you know, ideally, if 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 you've got a subcontractor who can produce a model, they they, they develop that um, that design a wee bit further. So they'll model brackets and stuff, which is so uh, there's a term uh, level of uh, detail, and the architect takes it to a certain level of detail, level of detail four. So that's the level of detail which would be you know typical for Riba stage four. Um, the subcontractor would take that to the next level, so almost like the kind of as installed level of detail. So, so they they're actually they're actually starting to model brackets and and stuff like that. Um, so, in an ideal world, you, you know, the whole model is taken to that level of detail five stage. Whereas, yeah, we're not quite at that stage, but but we've got more subcontractors. Um, and facade subcontractors are, are one example starting to to model for the first time and uh, they're definitely seeing the benefits but they still need to kind of assess each project to see if it's um, yeah. worth it because if you've got a contractor's design portion and you've got to go through the steps of the, the the fabricator of the steel has to go back and get their design approved by the the architect it cuts out all that doesn't it you know yeah mm -hmm. um yeah. Last question. I just want to question something. You, you told me in the end there about the as-built um, plans that you finally come up with, and you, sometimes you have contractors who find that issue. Do, do, you, uh, do you ever have a lot of uh, issues where, where the clash detection hasn't picked something up that on site has picked up when they're building off the plant? Has it ever come up? Have you ever had anything like that happen? So uh, there's a class discovered on site which wasn't discovered in the in the class detection. Is that, yeah. is that the question? Yeah. I think that will go down as a lessons learned uh, experience. Yeah, exactly. You're just, learn you're just learning for the next job. You know, we'll not do it again, basically. You know. I'm saying have they ever had it where they've given a model to a contractor, the contractor is going to be building, and as he's about to build, we'll go and they come up with a, they find a fault. In the, in the design for themselves and then they have to change that obviously then through the design but i'm saying with all the class detection he's talking about that they find in the vmi do you ever have a some have you ever had a scenario where the contractor that's actually building finds something that does clash that is a problem has that ever come up yeah well we had we had lessons learned meeting a month or two ago and, and one of the issues was that some things actually just weren't modeled at all so it didn't show up as a clash that actually had to be had to be built on site. So, you know, the architect says, "Oh, we don't normally model that," but the fact because that wasn't modelled, it didn't show up as a clash. But then it actually was built on site. So, so that's one thing that that uh, one problem we do get. So, we want to have almost like a schedule of things that aren't being modelled, um, so that we can accommodate for them. Another one is um, I'm trying to think what what, what it was. Uh, like almost like boxing around um, around a steel column, and the the kind of boxing around the column wasn't modelled. Um, so because of that, clashes wouldn't show up in your clash tests, which actually would happen on site. So ideally, you deal with that at the at the clash detection stage by by just going around and and modelling those um, in one way or another, so, so that so that they do show up as clashes. Because you, yeah, you want your models to mimic real life as much as possible, but it it is a problem we get. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question, John, please? Yeah. Hi, Tanya. Tanya. Hi, uh, hi, David. Thanks very much for the last couple of sessions as well. It's been really informative. 
Um, if we were interested in going and training in um, BIM, would there be a certain level of knowledge that you would need before that would be of benefit um, before you? Before you start, before yeah. you got some training? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, not really. I mean, it, it, every every training, you know, course um, it starts at beginner level. Um, there's there's lots of resources out there. I mean, there's lots of training you can get out there, both on the the information management side as well as a software side. Um, you know, I, I could send some some training that uh, training providers that that we've used if it, it would be helpful. Um, but no, there's there's no kind of base level of um, knowledge or training that you need before you you do that because there's always beginner level training available. Okay, yeah, if you could forward that, that would be really helpful. Thank you. It's something that we're trying to get going at an introductory level, Tanya. Um, we obviously do cover it to a certain point in the course here, but you know yourself that you know you, you only just sort of skim the surface, don't you? Mm -hmm. Um, the it's, it's software, software, sorry, software costs would probably be quite. Sorry, would the software costs be? In uh, well, we've, well, we've got we've got Revit here at the college, and I'm going to try and get everybody through their AutoCAD assessments earlier than usual, and try and get everybody skilled on some degree of Revit here. But again, you're still skimming the surface, you know. But you've got to start somewhere, you know. You've got to start somewhere. You, just by getting experience with the software, at least you understand the language, you understand what it's, what the purpose of it is. And even this kind of session here is the starting point, Tanya, you know, this is, you know, you're, you're picking up a lot of stuff here, actually, you know, I'm not saying you're going to be the finished article, but there's, there's <laughs> a journey, you know, but this is, this is the kind of stuff that you need to see how effective it can be used, you know. Oh, it's very comprehensive, definitely. Yeah, it's it's the way the world's going, so it would be good to be ahead of the game almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, that would be useful. I mean, um, I'm sure there's other colleges that offer more than we do in, in terms of BIM, but we're, we're trying to get to that stage at least. You know. We just need to clone you, John. Say again? We just need to clone you. <laughs> <laughs> they broke the mould, David, uh, Chris, broke the mould. Uh, Anybody, any other questions? Well, David, thanks again. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I think I speak for everybody here, and I think we've learned, we've learned a lot over the last couple of sessions. Uh, okay, that's good. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you've just saved us a load of, um, what do you call it, CPD time as well, so this is all this for us. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks right, you. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Thanks to Claire as well. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tanya. Bye-bye.